Welcome to the Kingdom. I'm Chris, and this is Good Enough Gaming. Welcome back to the Kingdom, everybody, and welcome to this unscripted video where we're going to take a look at the next release on Warhammer Old World Fantasy Battles. Looking at the fight phase here. So, uh, again, this is totally unscripted. In fact, I haven't even read the article yet. This is going to be as unscripted as it gets. So forgive me if there's a little bit of reading out loud to you, but I figure that's the best way to get a reaction. At least my reaction. So uh, what do we got here? Once again, I love the art. This looks a little bit older. This looks like something from a previous uh, edition or book. So some of you can point that out if you're familiar where this one came from. So they mention here, all right, we've, uh, we've talked about movement. We've talked about shooting. Now let's go to fighting. So what do we have here? You may not be surprised to discover that the fourth and final phase is divided into four steps. Choose and fight, calculate result, break test, and pursuit. That sounds pretty similar to what it used to be. Uh, of course, all of the details in that calculate result, that's going to be probably where the meat of the differences take place. Um, steps, it's too complicated to summarize in full here, but this should give you a flavor of how it works. Okay, so you begin the phase by choosing which combat you want to begin first. Now they don't mention if there's going to be any kind of back and forth like with uh, Sigmar where whoever's turn it is gets to do the, you know, chargers go first and then um, the other player gets to do the first existing combat. They don't mention that here, but it's possible that that won't actually be something we have to worry about. So let's just go with based on what it says. So fighting happens in ranks and only the first rank can fight. All right, so that's interesting. Now I see that little asterisk down there, so let's let's scroll down because I have a feeling I know exactly what it's going to say. The fighting rank. Certain units have the ability to fight in deeper ranks or offer supplementary attacks. So that's what I figured. So when I played my high elves because the basic infantry were armed with spears, the first two ranks got to fight with spears and because high elves were, uh, one of their army rules was the first three ranks got to fight the spears. So okay, that's the same. Uh, let's see, however, a unit with a wider front, wider fighting rank than its opponent can still attack with every model in that rank. Your troops surround and envelop the other regiment. So that's definitely different. At least I think it was. Again, it's been a while since I played Fantasy, but so you could have a unit of like 30 night goblins across, charge a unit of five swordsmen across, and it's going to be a 30 to 1 battle. That's an interesting change. Now notice what this next paragraph is, there are plenty of wrinkles to this. Some models may make supporting attacks from a deeper rank. I imagine that depends on army rules and on weaponry. Multiple units can be engaged in the same combat, and any model that is able to fight without being in base combat may only make one attack this turn. Okay, so what that means to me is if you have your unit of 30 front rank night goblins and it's charged by two five-man units, you're not going to get 30 attacks on each five-man unit. You're going to have to divvy up what uh, what soldiers are fighting in the one unit, what are fighting the other. Okay, that makes sense. And then also it talks about flanking and so on and so forth. So you're not going to be able to like have you know a, a massive death star of, of something and just attack from all angles. So, okay, makes sense so far. Nice little night goblins here. Uh, once you've worked out who can fight, it's time to determine initiative for each model and see who strikes first. First, all right. The model with the highest initiative stat strikes first, and so are down order. Okay, so that answers my question previously about um, when you know is chargers get to go first and then existing. It comes down to initiative, so that's coming back. Okay, uh, bonus for charging, and a bigger one for hitting them in the flank or rear. So that has an initiative change. That's interesting. There could still be a situation, however, in which a lumbering foe like a stone troll may find itself striking second on the charge against a preternatural senses of a swordmaster of Hoeth, initiative six. Now I wonder, the swordmasters used to have an additional rule because two-handed weapons in fantasy you always fought last. It was one of the penalties of having such a powerful weapon, but the swordmasters ignored that rule. That's what made them so good. Here, it looks like they're keeping that by just giving them a super high initiative. So I guess it's looking like weaponry isn't necessarily going to affect striking order. Maybe it is, but from what I'm reading here, it looks like they're going to roll all of that into initiative. Or perhaps maybe some weapons will adjust your initiative. Who knows? Uh, let's see. The big news here is that we're back to the classic weapon skill stat, which means a higher weapon skill is better. And to work out each model's to hit roll, you must compare your weapon skill against theirs. Yes, the to hit chart is back and 
beardy as ever. Bad news if you're a goblin spearman, but fantastic for the Bretonian duke who's about to skewer them. Okay, so let's let's put the whole chart here in the thing here. So it's it's pretty clear from the last video I did on shooting that I think very differently than everybody else in terms of charts. Now I know a lot of you uh, explained and you said, look, it's not that complicated of a table. You just do this, this, and that. I totally get that. My question, and I guess I didn't get it across very clearly, was Warhammer 40k used to have this. And they got rid of it because they said it was cumbersome. It was looking up stuff, it was constantly checking, and it, it, it dragged down the game. So they replaced it with that simple equation. Equal is 4, advantage is 3, disadvantage is 5, double is 6 or 2. And a lot of you had mentioned that this chart has a very similar kind of equation to it. And so then my question was, if it has that simple equation, just give us the equation and we don't need a chart. Whereas if it's not a simple equation and we do need a chart, the question is why? Because they got rid of it previously because they said it slowed the game down, but here there's the conscious decision to put it back in. So there may be a fairly basic equation that helps explain this, and from looking at it, yeah, for the most part I think it does, but it's not as clean as the 40K one where you just have that very simple comparison and you don't need a chart, it's just you know, real basic math. So, okay, we're going back to the hit chart. A lot of people like that. It might not be my favorite thing, but since I'm not the only customer, they don't have to worry about me. So thank you to those who made some comments on it, tried to clarify it. I'm still stuck with this idea of if you can condense this massive chart into an equation, why don't you do it? And if it's not that simple, then why did we take it out of 40K, but we're leaving it in fantasy? Unless that's what they're going for is that old aesthetic they're trying to bring back the game as close to what it was before with a few tweaks here and there so taking a look at it it looks like nothing will ever be harder than hitting on a five now that i don't have access to an immediate uh, to hit chart from the old one but that looks interesting there's no hitting on sixes the worst you can ever get is a five someone let me know if that's what it was previously or if there were uh, sixes to hit and then the the lowest of course goes to two you're never gonna get lower than that Okay. So yeah, looking at it again here. So if you have a 4 on a 4, obviously that's a 4. But on a 5, it's a 4. On a 6, it's a 4. On a 7, it's a 4. On an 8, it's a 4. That doesn't... Someone who's into math can maybe break it down for me. But this is exactly what I meant, where rather than go to a straight hit roll and a straight wound roll or an equation, we've got the chart here. So obviously, I feel differently than everybody else does. That's fine. Uh, let's see. So you roll as many dice as your engaged models have attacks, the higher initiative model striking first, and a charging unit has the opportunity to overwhelm its enemies before they have the wit to swing back. Next, you roll wound and make armor saves as normal. Okay, so that's that hasn't changed at all. Casualties are removed from the back ranks, that's still the same, representing the rear ranks stepping forward as their comrades bite the dirt. Uh, set every death in each unit aside, you'll need them for the next step. Okay, so we're going to keep that too. Combats in Warhammer the Old World are usually decisive. One side or the other makes the breakthrough and the loser is pushed back or breaks. Unlike in other Warhammer games, you don't flee based on your leadership alone. You have to calculate the combat results. In other words, you work out who's won by toting up... Toting? Is it supposed to be totaling? I think that might be an error there. Anyways, who's killed who? It's not just how many deaths you've caused, however, you get bonuses for ranks for having the high ground standard bears and the side rear. Okay, so that's very, very similar. Uh, the bonuses might be different, but those are the same things you got bonuses for in the old fantasy. So, yeah, one point for every wound, one point per rank, one for the standard, one for the BSB, uh, flank, rear, high ground, overkill. I can't remember if that was a thing. Probably was other bonuses as applicable so probably individual units or you know like maybe the undead get to add one to every combat result because they're super scary possible so that's very very familiar i like it that way it it's more than just killing models that, that that's what determines it i like this that it's weight of units that it's who has the shiny banner all other kinds of things like that so i like that uh, add it all up see who's won if it's a draw combat continues but if there's a clear loser, they take a break test. This is a leadership test modified by how much you lost combat by with several outcomes. If the natural roll is higher than the leadership, then the unit breaks and flees. 
and you can test on the champion or hero that's joined it. So we can go back to the whole squad of 30 skeletons or zombies with a uh, vampire lord beat stick who uh, you know, can do all the work and then also provide that, uh, that leadership role. If the modified role, okay, well, right, this is interesting. If the natural role is higher, it's a break. If the modified role is higher, but the natural role is lower, the unit falls back in good order. If the modified role is lower, or if you roll a double one, the unit gives ground. So that's entirely new. It used to be that really simple. You took the test. If you passed, combat continued. If you failed, you broke. And then you roll to see if uh, the attacking unit or the winning unit, if it advanced forward and, and did a clean sweep and wiped it out. So that's a very, very different mechanic. It kind of reminds me of a mix between Hail Caesar and Kings of War, where you can break and flee, you can fall back, you can give ground, or you can stay in combat. So that's interesting. Uh, as you can see, there's a substantial change to rules from the last few editions. Why, thank you, I just noticed that. And instead combines and reflects a selection of rules from earlier editions and spin-offs. It may seem complex at first glance, yeah, but it's a mechanic that quickly becomes clear once you've run a few, through a few combats and it adds a ton of tactical depth. I hope so. I really like what this is doing. One of the things I really think is cool about rank and flank is the idea that the battle line collides and both sides are fighting along this massive front and some areas can push while other areas fall back. You know, your right flank might be advancing whereas your center is just holding and then your left flank starting to collapse. And I think this is a great way to help simulate that, that the front line isn't just like a stick that all moves up forward or back at the same time, but instead it's like a string, you know, it can bend and twist. So I like this, this looks good. Break test, wait, wait, come back up here, sir. So we've got the break and fleas versus the break test. Okay, all right, they're just putting it in a chart. See what I mean? Rules condensed into chart. Tables condensed into equations. I'm getting a lot of I'm gonna get a lot of hate for that, but so be it. Alright, so our swordmasters leadership eight have come off worse in their combat against the stone troll, despite striking first, and have lost by three points. They must now take a break test with three possible outcomes. And then they've got them here. So if they uh, and it shows if they roll a five because their leadership is eight but they took three points loss. So in a dice roll up two to five, they give ground on a six, seven, or eight, they fall back, and then on a nine, 10, 11, or 12, they break and flee. So yeah, that'll take some getting used to because you have the two unmodified rolls here, or at least the unmodified roll here. It'll take some getting used to, but I like it. I think that's definitely worth the extra bookkeeping to figure out uh, what happens here. Uh, so we'll be discussing morale, breaking, and psychology next week, but we can now investigate the final step, pursuit. So when you win a combat, you have a range of choices depending on how the enemy reacts. Restrain, pass the leadership test to avoid pursuit. All right, I remember that. That's very similar. I think there were some units that had to, or units where it, the default was you could restrain, but you, if some units like berserkers and stuff, you had to roll to restrain them. Maybe I'm getting that one wrong. Uh, follow up, a unit that gave ground re-entering combat a few inches forward. Okay, so if the defending unit gives a little bit of ground, my question is, on their turn, can they then charge? Because they'll only be a few inches back. Can you get the charge followed by an immediate counter charge? It looks like we no longer have locked in combat. It doesn't exist. So either you wipe them out, or they fall back a little, or they fall back a lot. So that's interesting. So restrain, take a test to stay where you are and reform your ranks. Follow up, re-enter combat a few inches forward. So that's basically pushing the line. And then pursue a unit that flees or falls back. If you catch it, it's cut down and destroyed. Yeah, that's just like before. If you catch a unit falling back, combat begins again and the pursuer counts as having charged. All right. And then overrun, in the case the victor completely kills its target, it can make a full move directly forward and if you end up in another combat, it counts as a fresh charge. Yeah, clever use of overruns will have heavy cavalry looking at his lips. I get it. That is what made some armies and units absolutely devastating. If you could get a flank charge, 
you could literally roll up the entire line in a single round of combat if you were lucky. Now, they don't mention here if the, um, the fresh charge, like if you could literally do that, just keep charging into unit after unit, so that'd be interesting. There's plenty more in the combat phase. Wizards can use spells. Yeah, we've mentioned that. Spells are no longer spells. They're abilities and weapons. Kind of sad, but that's what it is. Uh, for instance, when fighting behind a barricade or extra protection. Okay, and then some examples of magic here. So, hammer hand is a combat close combat spell, 7+. plus. A single enemy takes 2d3 strength hits for it. Okay, yeah. So, it's, it's an ability with a dice roll. It's not automatic, but it's an ability with a dice roll. And then another example here. So that's it for this week's Rule Snapshot. The next week's installment is about morale, psychology, fear, terror, hatred, and all that good stuff. Okay, so very, very similar to what I recall and remember, except this. This looks like the biggest change, but I think it's a good change. I'm, I'm looking forward to this here. Now, I'm guessing because I'm looking forward to it, I'm going to get a lot of comments like, oh, no, I think it's stupid because that's how, that's apparently how I roll. What I like, nobody else does. But, uh, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. So let me know what you think. Are you excited for this? you think Melee is going to be a big deal? Do you think it's going to be absolutely decisive? Will it be a little too overpowered? Or do you think they've got it balanced just right? You let me know, because for now, I'd say that these changes look good enough.